Philippine Society for Micro Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. I welcome you to tonight's webinar entitled What We Know About COVID Vaccines, Preliminary Results from Phase 3 Clinical Trials. I'm Dr. Caroline Bernadette Kinkai Ignacio, a member of the PCPCME Committee and your moderator for this evening. Now, in the last few months, there's been a lot of uncertainty, speculations, questions, and understandable concerns surrounding the COVID-19 vaccines and its important role in this ongoing pandemic. These issues are what we hope to answer in this interactive discussion by our expert speakers and panelists. Now, if you'll have any questions or concerns throughout the entire presentation, please don't hesitate to type them in the chat box and we will do our best to address them in the Q&A portion. To start off, let us now have the invocation, national anthem, PCP, and then the PISMID hymn. Lord of Wisdom, Source of Intelligence. We welcome you to this auspicious gathering. An August moment for the pursuit of knowledge. That is offered for the glory of your name. We do not wish to ask you more than just you joining us today. But we look forward to your heavenly grace. To amplify the desire for truth. To look up for and become prudent to learning. Keep us grounded in your love and mercy, as we traverse a challenging path, to keeping the inclination of understanding. You and your most awe-inspiring creation, be with us, O Lord, and descend your spirit on us, to maintain an earnest desire, for knowledge, truth, and understanding you, the guide of the wise, the stronghold of the learned. This we ask through Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Now, to formally welcome everyone in the program, may I now call on no other than the President of the Philippine College of Physicians, Dr. Mario Panaligan. Yeah, uh, good evening. And of course, uh, thank God for this opportunity for us to share good information, meaning reliable and correct, particularly because we are giving you apps, uh, I think of course, some issues and clarifying some misconceptions but an exciting agent, which is actually COVID-19. No? Marami kasi na-excite, no? Literally, nung no, nag-start ng, ng pagbabakun, lalo, lalo sa UK at saka sa US, na nakataas ng COVID-19. No? But definitely, all of us must become familiar into how useful this vaccine is and how this can actually cause problems later on. And of course, we also need to get oriented on how we're gonna address some uh, issues, particularly the adverse reactions related to this vaccine. And I'm truly happy that PCP has again uh, started or is starting this, of course, webinar session for all the members, as well as for all colleagues that are truly interested in hearing correct information from our experts. And I'm happy that this is, this is again a collaborative work no, with, uh, of course, the frontline organization in infectious diseases, and that is the PSMID. And of course, I'd like to thank, of course, the CME Chair, Dr. Aldrin Loyola, for, of course, thinking about this particular webinar series. And oh, I would like to thank Dr. Caroline uh, Bernadette Kinkai Ignacio for, for um, getting into this to become the moderator for tonight's event. And of course, our speakers and panelists from PSMID, I'd like to thank, of course, Dr. Faith Villanueva and, of course, Dr. Catroa. And the panelists, the big panelists, of course. Number one is, of course, the president of the PSMID, Dr. Marisa Alejandria, uh, with the chair of the Committee on Adult Immunization, Dr. Minette Rosario, as well as Dr. Del Sabat and Dr. Zane Santos. Definitely, we will learn a lot. And it's quite important, really, for us to know more how this vaccine can affect us, particularly if we're not uh, too, if we'll not become too dependent on this. Because I need to emphasize that we should not forget, of course, important things, essential measures. If I have to say the APAPAT principle, we have to continue practicing it despite, of course, uh, the presence of this vaccine, even if we have, of course, received the vaccine later on. Again, maraming maraming salamat sa kanyong lahat. And I understand that uh, there's around 3,000 no, pre-registered uh, for this Zoom for us and we're also live in Facebook. So again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Panaligan, for your opening remarks. Now let us go to the heart of the matter. Let me introduce our two speakers who will give a back-to-back -back talk on COVID-19 vaccination. For our first speaker, of course, we have Dr. Faith Villanueva. She's a fellow of the Philippine College of Physicians and the Philippine Society of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. She's also an infectious disease consultant in various hospitals in Cebu and Mandawe. She's a member of the Adult Immunization Committee and the Committee on Health Education of the PSMID. She's also a past president of their Cebu chapter. She holds teaching positions at the University of Cebu School of Medicine, College of Medicine Cebu Doctors University, uh, and College of Medicine Vicente Gullas University, among others. She's a member of the European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the Philippine Hospital Infection Control Society, and the Philippine Foundation for Vaccination. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce our first speaker, Dr. Faith Villanueva. Now, before we move on to Dr. Villanueva's talk, let me introduce our second speaker already. She is a fellow as well of the PCP and the PSMID. Again, she's a consultant uh, in private clinics and different hospitals, including the Southern Philippines Medical Center in Davao. She's a member of the PSMID Southern Mindanao chapter and a member of their Adult Immunization Committee as well. She's the vice president of their Southern Mindanao chapter and a member of the Universal Healthcare Committee of the PCP. She's a site principal investigator for Southern Philippines Medical Center for the WHO Solidarity Trial and a chair of two 
um, infection control committee and antimicrobial stewardship committees in two hospitals. Um, she's a reviewer of the National Institute of Health Food and Drug Administration Review Panel and holds a teaching position at the Davao Medical School Foundation. Our second speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Dr. Catherine Roa. So now let me now let me now turn over the microphone to our first speaker. Go ahead, Dr. Faith Villanueva. Hello, good evening. Um, let me Okay. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, as well as the other members of the Adult Immunization Committee, I would like to express my gratitude for this opportunity to share important information on COVID-19 vaccinology, as well as COVID vaccines. So I have nothing to disclose, and this will be my topic outline for tonight. I will start with a discussion on the current burden of COVID-19 and then present to you the role of vaccines in this time of pandemic. And then lastly, talk to you about um, how COVID-19 vaccines work, the regulatory approval process that these vaccines have to go through before they can be used, and the um, important safety precautions that we have to keep and bear in mind with regards to this vaccine. This is where we are right now, a year after, just to remind you, COVID-19 was first identified in an outbreak of respiratory infections in Wuhan, China in December 2019. It was declared a public health emergency of international concern by the World Health Organization in January 2019. And then it was declared a pandemic also by the WHO in March 11, 2020. As of yesterday, January 19, 2021, the global total number of confirmed cases is uh, approaching 95 million with more than 2 million deaths. In the country, as of yesterday, the total number of confirmed cases is, has already breached the 500,000 mark with about 9,978 deaths. As of yesterday, out of the 27,857 active cases, 86% are mild cases, 2.7% um, are severe cases, and then 4.7% are critical cases. Currently, the concerns are the rising numbers seen after the Christmas holiday as seen in the tail end of the upper graph. Although as shown in the tail end of the lower graph, there is no corresponding increase in deaths post-holiday season. This remains a concern because if the cases continue to rise, the chances of more deaths also increase. Another concern is the emergence of what we call SARS-CoV-2 variants. And I would like to run th through you the four variants that have been identified by the WHO. The D614G variant emerged in late January 2020 or sometime early February 2020. Um, and then by June 2020, it had become the dominant cir variant circulating globally. It has increased infectivity and transmission, although it does not seem to cause more severe illness or it does not affect the effectiveness of existing laboratory diagnos diagnostics, therapeutics, public health preventive measures, and even the vaccines. The cluster five variant was identified in a mink farm in Denmark in August to September, 2020. And subsequently it caused 12 human infections, but has not appeared to spread widely. The UK variant, which is officially named VOC or Virus of Concern 2020-12-01 um, was first reported in Southeast England in December 14, 2020, and its origin remains unknown. Preliminary analysis suggests that it has increased transmissibility, but without change in disease um, severity. 
Furthermore, a, a, a mutation in position 69 and 70 uh, renders the virus, um, renders some difference in the performance of some diagnostic PCR assays uh, for the target, uh, for the S gene that is targeted by the assays. Now, most PCR assays that are in use right now, including what we are using in the country, targets have multiple targets. So therefore the impact of this mutation on laboratory, laboratory testing is not anticipated to be significant. As of December 31, 2020, the UK variant has been reported in around 31 countries, including the Philippines, which reported its first uh, case of the variant last January 13, 2021. He was a Filipino who returned to the country from United Arab Emirates on January 7, 2021. The last variant is 501Y.2. Uh, this was detected in South Africa on December 18, 2020, and it has spread um, to about three provinces there. Uh, similar to the UK variant, preliminary studies suggest that this variant is associated with a higher viral load, hence the potential for increased transmissibility. However, there is no clear evidence that it is associated with more severe disease and as of December 30, this variant had been reported in other in four other countries. Currently, the concerns are sorry. So indeed, we are still in a pandemic, and the question that we are often asked is, will this ever end? Um, this may be hard to imagine right now, but the answer is actually yes. We are hopeful that we will see the end to this pandemic through the establishment of acquired immunity. Acquired immunity is established at the level of the individual, either through natural infection or through immunization with a vaccine. And then depending on the prevalence of existing immunity to a pathogen in a population, the introduction of an infected individual will lead to different outcomes. In a completely naive population, a pathogen will propagate through susceptible hosts in an unchecked manner, following effective exposure of susceptible host. However, if a fraction of the population has immunity to that same pathogen, the likelihood of an effective contact between the infected and susceptible host is reduced since many hosts are immune and therefore cannot transmit the pathogen. So this is what we call herd immunity. Basically, herd immunity stems from the effects of individual acquired immunity scaled to the level of the population. And it is here where immunization is integral. Now, because SARS-CoV-2 is a novel pathogen, one of the unknowns remains the durability and duration of immunity after an infection. Hence, we are relying on vaccines to help us attain herd immunity. How do we achieve herd immunity? So herd immunity is achieved when the herd immunity threshold is reached. This is the point at which the proportion of susceptible individuals in a population falls below the threshold needed for transmission. To establish herd immunity, the immunity generated by natural, or inf natural infection or vaccination must prevent onward transmission, not just the clinical disease. Now, it is not acceptable to rely on natural infection to achieve herd immunity because this will lead to unacceptable and unnecessary human deaths so that we must rely on vaccination. Vaccination for most infections is a critical way to reach the number of immune individuals necessary to achieve herd immunity. And this is most commonly used in the design of vaccination programs where defining the percentage of the population that must be immune to cause infection must be immune to cause infection incidences to decline constitute the target for vaccination coverage. The herd immunity threshold depends on a single parameter known as R0, which is written as R subscript zero. This is also known as the basic reproduction number. R0 refers to the average number of secondary infections 
caused by a single infectious individual introduced into a completely susceptible population. If we consider a hypothetical pathogen with an R0 of 5, this means that on average, one infected host will infect five others during the infectious period, assuming no immunity exists in the population. Mathematically, the ERD immunity threshold is defined as 1 minus 1 over R0. For example, if R0 is 4, the ERD immunity threshold is 0 0.75. This is calculated as 1 over 4, which is 0 0.25, subtracted from 1, that is 0 0.75. Therefore, the more communicable the pathogen, the greater is the associated R0 and the greater the proportion of the population that must be immune to block sustained transmission. Examples of pathogens with high r naughts include missiles and polio, which have 90% and 80% ERD immunity thresholds, respectively. For COVID-19, although this has not been um, definitely ascertained, the current estimated R0 is 2.5 to 3. So using an R0 of 3, and by calculation, 1 over 3 equals 0 0.33, subtract this from 1, that's 0 0.67 times 100. The herd immunity threshold is 67% for SARS-CoV-2. Then it is suggested that 60 to 70% of the population should be immunized to halt the spread. In the example shown in this slide, for a population of 3 billion, about 2 billion, which is 70%, should become immune to achieve herd immunity. Here in the Philippines, based on the 2020 Philippine statistics, for our population of 109 million plus, we have to vaccinate around 73 million Filipinos to achieve herd immunity. It is indeed a lot, but epidemiologically and scientifically, it is what is needed. You probably heard our president and other government uh, leaders mention this much number of people that needed that needs to be vaccinated in the country. Now we talk about generalities of COVID-19 vaccines. This, the discussion on the specific vaccines will be done by the second speaker. Now, COVID-19 vaccines work the same way as other vaccines for other pathogens. Basically, the, the administered vaccine will induce the body's immune response to the virus. To better understand this, let us review how SARS-CoV-2 causes infection. The virus enters a host cell through the binding of its spike protein to the ACE receptors on the surface of the cell. Utilizing the cell's enzymes and other metabolic pathways, the virus infuses with the endosomal membrane, leading to the release of its RNA, which undergoes translational processes to produce more viral RNA, which are assembled into new viruses that ultimately exit the cell to infect other cells. And now this is how our immune system responds to the virus. The viral presence triggers the activation of specialized cells called antigen-presenting cell, which engulf the viruses and break them down into what we call viral peptides. These peptides are sensed by the T helper cells, and this sensing triggers the dual response of the immune system. The dual response includes, number one, the activation of the B cells to produce antibodies, which prevent the virus from infecting other cells and which mark the virus for destruction. And the second response is activation of the cytotoxic T cells, which identify and destroy virus-infected cells. Thereafter, memory B and T cells remain and can recognize the virus again so that reinfection is either prevented or rendered less severe. COVID-19 vaccines basically provide the trigger signals for the T helper cells to activate the immune system. Studies on coronavirus cells determined that antibodies that bind to the viral spike protein, specifically to its receptor binding protein or RBD, 
prevent viral attachment, host cell, and neutralize the virus. Together with information from preclinical studies on SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, the spike protein was very early on identified as the antigenic target for SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Basically, the research that was conducted on SARS-CoV that caused an epidemic in 2003 to 2004 and MERS-CoV that caused an epidemic in 2012 laid down the foundation for the development of COVID-19 vaccines. Shown in this slide are the different platforms in the COVID-19 vaccine development pipeline. This includes the traditional platforms exemplified by the inactivated and live attenuated uh, vaccines, the newer platforms that include the recombinant and vectored vaccines, and the what we call new kids in the block, which are the DNA and RNA vaccines. Currently, there are more than 180 vaccine candidates in the pipeline, about 10 in phase three clinical trials and five licensed vaccines. Let me go through the mechanism of action of the different kinds of vir virus uh, uh, vaccine platforms. The virus vaccines, which are considered the traditional vaccine platforms, are either attenuated live virus or inactivated um, dead viruses. Basically, after administration, these viruses are engulfed by the antigen-presenting cells and, are, and the peptides are recognized by the T helper cells, and then this basically triggers the immune response. Protein-based vaccines are either recombinant vaccines that utilize either the viral protein subunits or virus-like particles, VLPs, that do not contain the viral genetic component. Similarly, after administration, they are engulfed by the APC, they are sensed by the T helper cells, and once again, this triggers the immune response, the body's immune response. Vectored vaccines are SARS-CoV-2 spike protein genes that are incorporated into a different virus that can infect a host cell without producing disease. These vector viruses may be either replicating or non-replicating. The most commonly used viral, viru viral vector for vaccines is adenovirus, which causes the common cold. The newest vaccine platform are those that contain nucleic acid that codes for the spike protein. In other words, the genetic information for the antigen, which is the spike protein, instead of the antigen itself or the spike protein itself, is delivered into the body. There are two forms, the DNA vaccine, which requires translation into mRNA, and the mRNA vaccine, which is delivered via lipid nano particles. This, here is a comparison of the salient characteristics of the different vaccine platforms and examples of specific vaccines. But as shown in this slide, aside from peptides and nucleic acid, as I mentioned a while ago, COVID-19 vaccines being developed utilize other um, platforms as well. This is an overview of the COVID-19 vaccine development pipeline as of September 2020. Again, more than 180 vaccine candidates of different platforms in varying stages of clinical trials. Now, it is reasonable to expect that not all 180 candidates will become useful vaccines, but we do hope and pray that we will have enough vaccines for equitable global distribution. Now we move on to the COVID-19 vaccine regulatory process. Traditional vaccine development can take up to 15 years or more. Then, and usually this starts with a lengthy discovery phase in which vaccines are designed and exploratory preclinical experiments are conducted. This is followed by more formal preclinical experiments and toxicology studies together with the development of production procedures. At this time, an IND or investigational new drug application is filed. And when this is granted by the regulatory agency, the candidate enters phase one and then two and then three clinical trials. Once phase three trials are completed, 
and the predetermined outcomes are met, a BLA or biologics license application is filed, which is reviewed by the regulatory agencies, then the vaccine is licensed. Thereafter, large-scale production begins. But as you can see, the COVID-19 vaccine development pipeline follows an accelerated timeline. Again, much thanks to the preclinical data and information from SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV research, the discovery phase is omitted. Rather, the candidate vaccine is entered into phase one, then two, then three, and even overlapping phase one and two, and two and three trials, so that several trials, trial stages are running in parallel. During this time, for some candidates, large-scale production is also started at the company's risk. Now, because of the urgency of the need, interim results of phase three trials with at least a 50% vaccine efficacy and two months safety trial safety data are then submitted to the regulatory agencies for the issuance of an emergency use authorization. So from 15 years, the timeline can be shortened to as much as, 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 as short as 10 months to one and a half years. This is truly amazing, albeit this is riddled with so many unknowns and uh, understandably marked by reasonable apprehensions. So this is just a closer look into the clinical phases of trials. Phase one tests a vaccine candidate on a small group of people, usually 20 to 80 of healthy people. And this is to determine its safety and side effects, and also to determine the correct dosage, as well as information on how well the vaccine works to induce an immune response. Phase two trial uses more people, about 100 to 300. While the emphasis in phase one is on safety, the emphasis on phase two is on effectiveness. This phase aims to obtain preliminary data on whether the, the candidate vaccine works in people who have certain disease or conditions while continuing to study safety, short-term side effects, relationship between those administered and immune response. Phase three trial gathers more information on safety and efficacy studies, st efficacy, it studies different populations and different dosages. It uses the drug in combination with other drugs, and then it uh, determines the uses of the drug on broad demographic groups. The number of subjects usually ranges from several hundred to thousands of people. And then after completion of this phase, and if the regulatory agency agrees with the trial results, it will approve the candidate vaccine for use of the vaccine on the general population. Phase four trial, which is not in this slide, is basically this takes place after the approval for use of the vaccine. And in phase four, the vaccine's efficacy and safety continues to be monitored in the large diverse population because we know that the effectiveness and side effects may not become clear until more people have received it for a longer period of time. Now we talk about EUA in the context of COVID-19 vaccines. Emergency use authorization or EUA is the authority to make a vaccine available before a full application is approved by the Food and Drug Administration. This is not in any sense a lower standard, but rather it is a more tailored flexible standard intended to help protect those who need it the most right away while more in evidence is being generated. To receive an authorization for emergency use, vaccine developers must demonstrate that the vaccine's known or potential benefit outweighs the known and potential risks. As I mentioned a while ago, the US FDA requirements for the issuance of an EUA are interim results of vaccine efficacy of at least 50% and two months date safety data. Here in the Philippines, um, uh, the president signed last December 1, 2020, 
Executive Order 121 Series of 2020, which grants the Philippine FDA Director General the authority to issue emergency use authorization for COVID-19 vaccines. And thereafter, the Philippine FDA Circular 2020-036, which is the guidelines on the insurance of emergency use authorization for drugs and vaccines for COVID-19, was released on December 14, 2020. Basically, the circular um, describes the guidelines on the EUA process as well as lists the requirements for the EUA application. It is very important to remember that the EUA is valid only within the duration of the declared public health emergency due to COVID-19. And we learned that this has been declared up to the end of 2021, unless there is going to be an extension. We hope and pray that it will end before then. And it is also very important to note that the EUA is not a marketing authorization or a certificate of product registration. Hence, the vaccine cannot be sold, sold commercially. For the granting of EUA for COVID-19 vaccines, all of the following must be present. Number one, based on the totality of evidence available, including data from studies, from adequate and well-known controlled trials, it is reasonable to believe that the vaccine may be effective to prevent COVID-19. Number two, the known potential benefits of the vaccine outweigh the known and potential risks. And number three, there is no adequate, approved, and available alternative. With limited vaccine stocks, the challenge becomes how to properly use them to achieve the biggest impact. For this, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, or SAGE, of the WHO recommends a roadmap for the utilization of vaccine stock stocks. As shown in this slide, stage one scenario is when there is very limited vaccine availability um, that can cover for about 1% to 10% of the national population only, so that the priority groups are uh, the health workers at high to very high risk of acquiring and transmitting the infection, and second, the older adults defined by the country or region-specific age-based risk. Scenario two is limited vaccine availability, about 11 to 20 percent for the national of the national population and you can see that the priority list is longer than for stage one this now includes older adults not covered in stage one and then other individuals with comorbidities um, people with the social demographic groups at significantly higher risk of severe death disease or death health workers engaged in immunization delivery, and high-priority teachers and school staff. And then in scenario three, this is for moderate vaccine availability. The vaccine availability is good for about 21 to 50 percent of the national population. And as you can see, the priority, the list of priority groups have become longer. Lastly, let's talk about safety precautions for COVID-19 vaccines. And to simplify the discussion, I group this into precautions taken by the regulatory agency. Uh, precautions, those um, precautions expected from the vaccinees and those that must be ensured by the providers. From the Philippine FDA, ensuring safety of COVID-19 vaccines include the creation of the vaccine expert panel tasked to do the continuing review of results of clinical trials and provision of recommendations, um, putting in place uh, vaccine safety monitoring, uh, vaccine safety monitoring systems all over the country, and the responsibility to, responsibility to impose upon the EUA holder the commitment on pharmacovigilance and completion of the clinical trials. We need to educate all vaccinees, basically everybody who will be getting the vaccines. It is very important that every vaccinee know the benefits of getting the vaccine. They know which vaccines have to be approved for use 
They know the excipients in the vaccine to determine allergy. They know the possible side effects of the vaccine. And um, activities like this is actually very important, but we really need to scale such activities to involve uh, the, the general public for them to be aware of this uh, important information about the vaccines. And then for the vaccine provider, ensuring safety for the vaccines include um, compliance with standard procedures for vaccination, notably adherence to recommended observation periods and the capability of recognizing severe re reactions as well as managing them accordingly. It is important that in vaccination sites, the minimum requirements must be in place at all times listed. The minimum requirements listed in this slide must be in place at all times together with trained staff and medical personnel. So I think this is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. And I give the floor to Dr. Kat. Thank you, Dr. Villanueva. So for my part, we'll go into the nitty gritty of things. As you know, uh, once we start talking about vaccines, uh, we really cannot get away from reviewing the evidence and looking at safety and efficacy. Uh, hopefully the information that uh, we will all learn uh, tonight uh, will be useful to everyone, not only when you make decisions with regards to uh, vaccinating uh, your family, but even yourself. You can make uh, informed decisions uh, because it's not as simple as just uh, relying on the efficacy. So I'd like to thank uh, my uh, fellow committee members of the Adult Immunization Committee of the PSMID, as well as the Philippine COVID-19 Living um, CPG Group. Uh, I have no disclosures for this lecture. And this is the outline for tonight's lecture. So definition of terms. And then we go to the phase three trial, safety and efficacy, uh, so that we will know what to expect uh, from the different uh, vaccines. Um, these are the three vaccines with available phase three uh, trial results. And then we go to the clinical recommendations um, given by uh, CDC and WHO in terms of uh, using the, the vaccines. So first immunogenicity it is the ability of the vaccine to elicit a measurable immune response. So instead of um, the infectious agent um, inducing antibody production, we have uh, vaccination and the vaccine uh, to elicit an immune response. Reactogenicity is a subset of reactions occurring soon after receipt of a vaccine. These are physical manifestations of the inflammatory response to vaccination. So from the um, act of uh, injecting itself, we can have tissue injury and presence of immunostimulant. And then we can have local production of vasodilators, complement factors, and prostaglandins that leads to local symptoms, such as swelling, pain, and redness. Prostaglandins. And these lead to systemic symptoms, fever, and fatigue. So what are adverse events? These are any untold temporarily associated with the use of study intervention, whether or not considered related to the study intervention. While serious adverse events or any untoward medical occurrence that results in death, is life-threatening, results in hospitalization or prolongation of existing hospitalization, results in persistent disability or incapacity, and um, is a congenital anomaly or birth defect. These two concepts are very important, vaccine and vaccine effectiveness. And I hope that uh, 
if there's one thing that we can take away from from this uh, lecture, it will be what efficacy is. So for the definition, efficacy is the reduction in disease due to vaccination, while effectiveness uh, refers to reduction in clinical outcomes due to vac vaccination as well. Efficacy is done, to determine efficacy, it is done under RCT, and the, the trial is carried out under controlled conditions and ideal setting. However, effectiveness, vaccine effectiveness, is not done under RCT. It's done after programmatic implementation and in the real world. Um, it is estimated from observational studies. And when we talk about scenario benefit, because you have a very ideal and uh, the conditions are controlled, in determining efficacy, you actually get the best case scenario. While because um, you are... Um, implementing the program in the real world, when you determine effectiveness, you can have other factors that uh, come into play, such as the age, um, comorbidities, immune um, um, system, the immune system of, of the individual you're vaccinating. So the, re the response uh, could also uh, differ. And thus, when we measure the vaccine effectiveness, we can have the worst case scenario. So um, often, vaccine effectiveness is lower than vaccine efficacy. So what does 90% efficacy mean? You know, we have been hearing 95% uh, efficacy, 90% efficacy, and it's like people are very fixated on efficacy. There is, uh, there seems to be a, a misunderstanding that uh, it is... Uh, straightforward. Like, for example, if uh, there are 10 individuals and you vaccinate all of them, 90%, for some people, what they believe efficacy to mean is that if you vaccinate 10 people, nine people will not get the disease, one person will. So that's 90% efficacy for them. However, that is not what efficacy is. Um, what 90% efficacy means that, that there is a 90% reduc reduction in cases of disease in the vaccinated group compared to the unvaccinated group. So meaning when we determine um, efficacy, it's always a comparison between the vaccinated group and the unvaccinated group. It's not as straightforward as my first example. Another way of putting it is under the same conditions as the study, the vaccine reduces the risk of infection by 90% compared to the unvaccinated group. So let's talk about the first uh, vaccine, BioNTech-Pfizer vac vaccine. Uh, so this was published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's an R mRNA, as mentioned by Dr. Faith. There's no adjuvant. Two doses, 21 days apart, administered intramuscularly. Trial location for the phase, th uh, phase one to three uh, trials were, uh, was in the U.S. Um, 43,448 participants and 37,706 um, analyzed. 46% of participants had comorbidities, and these are the comorbidities, chronic, chronic lung disease, significant cardiac disease, obesity, diabetes, liver disease, and HIV. However, for um, the HIV uh, subgroup, they did not include this subgroup in the efficacy evaluation, but they, will, um, they said that they will uh, do a subgroup analysis for this um, later. For safety, let's talk about safety first. So um, they, solicited, they have solicited um, specific local or systemic adverse events and use of antipyretic or pain medication within seven days after the receipt of each dose also unsolicited adverse events through one month after the second dose, and unsolicited serious adverse events through six months after the second dose. For this report, um, they were only able to include a follow-up of 14 weeks after the second dose. So even if the, the study itself, the protocol says that follow-up should be for two years, um, however, uh, for the purpose of their EUA application, um, they had to do an interim analysis and they were only able to do 14 weeks of um, follow-up after the second dose. So we should always um, keep in mind uh, how long the, the follow-up period is when the report was written. 
For local events within seven days from dose one and two, so we will see here that the most predominant um, local event is pain at the injection site, almost similar between the um, um, in dose one and dose two, and also in both um, ages. Uh, more prevalent in the um, vaccine group as compared to the placebo group. So for systemic events within seven days from dose one, it's very important that uh, we look at all of these um, systemic events and also local events because we need to be able to predict uh, the types of adverse reactions that you know, we will potentially have uh, once we get the vaccine or uh, what our patients will have. So for the systemic events, um, the most common, more common ones were fatigue, headache, muscle pain, uh, joint pains, chills, and diarrhea, and more frequent in the vaccine group as opposed to the placebo group. So uh, most of, of these were mild. Uh, mild means there's no interference in the daily activities. Okay, so this is uh, after dose one. So let's look at after dose two. So after dose two, if you can see here, uh, still there's fatigue, headache, chills, muscle pain, joint pain, and diarrhea, but now we're also seeing some fevers, okay? Um, and the younger group seem to have uh, more reactions to the, to the vaccines uh, as opposed to the uh, older group, the over 55s. So these are the common systemic events. Uh, for the other adverse events, we have lymphadenopathy, uh, which occurred in 64 of the vaccine recipients versus six in the placebo recipients. And there were four related serious adverse events that uh, were reported among the vaccine recipients. The bold-faced uh, first two items were uh, deemed by the FDA as related to the vaccine, and these are shoulder-related injury related to vaccine administration and right axillary lymphadenopathy, while the next two were deemed by the FDA as unrelated to the vaccine, and these are paroxysmal uh, ventricular arrhythmia and right leg paresthesia. So there were also some unrelated deaths. So these deaths were already adjudicated as not related to the vaccine. So two deaths in the, uh, in the vaccine recipients and four in the placebo recipients. They were also able to see uh, cases of appendicitis, which they labeled as uh, serious adverse events. So eight cases in the vaccine participants and four in the placebo participants. Uh, however, current available information is insufficient to determine a causal relationship. They were also able to see Bell's palsy cases. Uh, four patients in the vaccine group. Onset was uh, day 37 after the first dose and also day three, day nine, and day 48 after the second dose. Again, uh, currently available information is insufficient to determine a causal, causal relationship. So for the safety profile, for the summary of the BioNTech Pfizer machine, uh, vaccine, reactogenicity was generally mild or moderate. Reactions were less common and milder in older adults than in younger adults. So when we say older adults, it's 55 and over. In younger adults, uh, 16 uh, to 55. Local reactogenicity were similar after the two doses. Systemic reactogenicity was more common and severe after the second dose than after the first dose. Severe fatigue occurred in approximately 4% of vaccine recipients. Um, the um, signs and symptoms were transient and resolved within a couple of days. However, for lymphadenopathy, uh, it resolved within 10 days. Um, serious adverse events were similar in the vaccine and placebo groups, so that's 0.6% and 0.5% respectively. So let's talk about efficacy. When, when trials uh, um, conduct, 
efficacy studies, they usually have um, endpoints. They determine the endpoints. So the pr first primary endpoint for this study was efficacy of the vaccine against confirmed COVID-19 with an onset at least seven days after the second dose in participants who had been without serologic or virologic evidence of SARS-CoV-2 um, infection up to uh, seven days after the second dose. Um, so the denominator for this uh, primary endpoint was 36,523. For the second primary endpoint, effic efficacy in participants with and without evidence of prior COVID-19 um, infection, and the denominator for this was 40,137. So for the definition of their confirmed COVID-19, what they used was at least one symptom combined with a respiratory specimen obtained plus minus four days of the symptomatic period that was positive for SARS-CoV-2 by a nuclear, um, nucleic acid amplification test. So when we look at the efficacy endpoints here, for those for uh, COVID-19 occurrence at least seven days after the second dose in participants without evidence of infection, so this is without prior evidence of infection, the vaccine efficacy is 95%. COVID-19 occurrence at least seven days after the second dose in participants with and those without evidence of infection was 94.6%. So for severe COVID, which is also one of their um, secondary endpoints, uh, the vaccine efficacy was 66.4%. So again, we are comparing the occurrence of severe COVID um, in the vaccine group as compared to the placebo group. So limitation of this um, trial, there's a short period of observation. As we have mentioned earlier, the, the uh, observation period was about 14 weeks post the second dose. Uh, the, the study team uh, has acknowledged that they will not be able to maintain the placebo group uh, in the next two years uh, because, of course, there's already a rollout of the vaccine and they cannot stop their placebo group from getting the vaccine. It's uh, ethically unacceptable. Uh, does not address whether vaccination prevents asymptomatic infection and does not address vaccination in other populations such as younger adolescents, children, pregnant women, and immunocompromised persons. So the second vaccine is a uh, NIAID uh, Moderna vaccine. This is the mRNA1273 vaccine. So this is also an mRNA vaccine. Um, um, it is formulated in a lipid, lipid nanoparticle, uh, two doses, 28 days apart, also uh, intramuscularly. So phase three trial was done in the U.S. Uh, with 30,420 participants. So um, we have here, um, so if we recall for the Pfizer trial, they had subjects from 16 years old and over. Uh, for uh, the Moderna trial, they had uh, participants uh, from 18 years old uh, above. So uh, they have participants uh, both with and without comorbidities, as well as uh, over 65s. Uh, with and without comorbid conditions. And for this trial, the comorbid conditions uh, included chronic lung disease or moderate to severe asthma, significant cardiac disease, severe obesity, diabetes, liver disease, and stable HIV infection. For the safety um, assessment, they solicited local and systemic adverse reactions that occur during the seven days following each dose. Unsolicited AEs observed or reported during the 28 days following each dose, AEs leading to the discontinuation from vaccination and or study participation from day one through 759 or withdrawal from the study, uh, medically attended adverse events from day one through day 759 or withdrawal from the study, and severe adverse events from day one through day 759 or withdrawal from the study. So day 759 is actually two years of follow-up time. Uh, for the primary analysis, for this interim analysis, 
uh, they were able to follow up only uh, up to a median of nine weeks. So again, uh, let's keep that in mind uh, when we uh, look at the different vaccines. So again, Pfizer had 14 weeks of follow-up and Moderna had nine weeks of follow-up post the second dose. Uh, the most solicited local adverse reactions were mild to moderate, and after the first infection, uh, injection, uh, the most common one was pain, uh, occurring mostly in the vaccine group uh, and more in the younger subgroup. For the second injection, again, uh, there were more uh, local adverse reactions this time, so pain, erythema, swelling, and axillary swelling or tenderness. And uh, for pain, again, uh, mostly occurred in the uh, younger group. For the solicited systemic adverse reactions, uh, most were mild to moderate. After the first injection, we can see here, uh, people experienced fatigue, headache, myalgia, arthralgia, chills, and nausea and vomiting. And uh, mostly for, the fat for fatigue and headache, most of these were in the vaccine group as well as the myalgia. But for the rest, it's almost equal distribution between the vaccine group and the placebo group. For the um, second injection, uh, we can see here fatigue, headache, myalgia, arthralgia. And we can see... Uh, more severe, uh, still mild to moderate, but we're seeing, you know, more yellows this time. And again, more in the younger subgroup compared to the over 65 or um, 65 and older. So these are the common uh, unsolicited adverse events, uh, 28 days after any injection. So we see here headache, cough, oropharyngeal pain, diarrhea, arthralgia, myalgia, fatigue, and injection site pain. And for the unsolicited severe uh, adverse events, uh, we see here headache, bradycardia, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, myalgia, arthralgia, back pain, fatigue, uh, increase in blood pressure, uh, increase in systolic blood pressure. So an adverse event is defined as any event not present before exposure to the study vaccination or any event already present that worsens in, in intensity or frequency after exposure. So if you have read uh, one of the um, participants in, no, one of the vaccinees in, in the U.S. who had an allergic reaction to the Moderna vaccine, uh, her blood pressure shot up from a systolic of 125 to 185 a few minutes after um, vaccination. So SAE is considered as related by the investigator. So all of these, however, um, the FDA uh, adjudicated all these events and three were likely related to the vaccine, and these are intractable nausea and vomiting, facial swelling in two cases. So what's common in the facial swelling in these two cases were dermal filler cosmetic injection uh, prior to the uh, vaccination. So six months, one patient experienced, uh, had the dermal filler six months prior to the vaccine, and the other uh, patient had the dermal filler two weeks prior to the vaccine. The next three uh, cannot be excluded. So these are uh, um, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, dyspnea with exertion and peripheral edema and autonomic dysfunction. However, for the other uh, ser um, serious adverse events, um, it was um, adjudicated as an unrelated to the vaccine by the FDA. 
So for the safety summary, solicited adverse events at the injection site occurred more frequently in the vaccine group after both doses. The most common injection site event was pain after injection. And this was quite interesting. They had delayed injection site reaction onset on or before or on or after day eight uh, from the time of the injection. And it was noted in 244 uh, participants after the first dose and 68 participants after the second dose. So there was erythema, induration, and tenderness, which resolved over the fo following four to five days. And the most common treatment-related adverse events were fatigue and headache, both in the vaccine and placebo groups. So let's look at the efficacy objectives of uh, the Moderna vaccine. For the primary endpoint, the vaccine efficacy to prevent COVID-19. And then they also had secondary endpoints, uh, which included vaccine efficacy to prevent severe COVID, death due to COVID, COVID-19 using CDC case definition, uh, symptomatic COVID-19 disease occurring after the first dose, and asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. Again, keep in mind the follow-up time uh, of the subjects uh, for this interim analysis was quite short. So understandably, they don't really have um, all the, they were not able to measure all the secondary endpoints that um, they set out to do. For efficacy, this is uh, COVID-19 infection rate. Uh, so vaccine efficacy is 94.1%. Uh, this is more than or equal to 14 days after the second dose of the vaccine. For severe COVID, vaccine efficacy is 100%. So uh, we will see, of course, as we, um, as more... Um, subjects or people are being vaccinated, then we will see more of the effects. So limitations of this study is short duration of safety and efficacy follow-up, uh, lack of an identified correlate of protection, insufficient data to assess asymptomatic infection. Again, the, the follow-up time was simply too short. Uh, limited efficacy evaluations in older adults, um, participants from ethnic minor or racial minorities and previously infected persons. Uh, and also pregnant women and children were excluded from this trial. So these are interim clinical considerations for the use of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines with EUA in the U.S. And this was uh, published by the CDC. So, and this is quite important. Once we, uh, you know, determine which of our patients we would eventually um, recommend for a vaccine uh, or, you know, when we choose the vaccines that uh, we think would be best for us or our patients. Uh, for persons with a current or prior history of SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, vaccination is safe in persons. So, so we are talking about the mRNA vaccines here. We'll talk about the uh, non-replicative vector vaccine uh, later, which is the Astra vaccine. So this recommendation from the CDC is particularly for um, the mRNA vaccine. So it's safe in persons with evidence of prior infection. Viral testing to assess for acute SARS-CoV-2 infection or for prior infection for the purposes of vaccine decision-making is not recommended. Persons with known current infection should be deferred until the person has recovered from the acute illness and criteria has been met to discontinue isolation. The point here is that we do not want these um, individuals with current infection to be infecting um, the healthcare workers and the people in the vaccine centers. Persons who previously received passive antibody therapy, there's no data on safety and efficacy of mRNA vaccines in persons who received uh, monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma. The recommendation is to defer for at least 19, 90 days. For persons receiving other antibiotic therapies like IVIG or Rogam, which is not related to COVID treatment, there's no recommended minimum interval between other antibody therapies and mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. Next is vaccination, vaccinating persons with a known SARS-CoV-2 exposure or during COVID-19 outbreaks. It's currently not recommended um, for outbreak management or for post-exposure prophylaxis. 
Persons in the community or outpatient setting who have had a known COVID-19 exposure should not seek vaccination until their quarantine period has ended. Again, the reasoning here is similar to the uh, first one that we uh, expounded on earlier, that we do not uh, want to expose the healthcare workers and the other uh, individuals in the vaccine centers uh, to these people who were exposed to um, positive cases. Residents with a known COVID-19, um, these are residents uh, living in congregate settings with a known COVID-19 exposure. So these can be people in long-term care facilities, correctional and detention facilities, and homeless shelters may be vaccinated. So vaccinations of persons with underlying medical conditions, they may receive the vaccine unless with contraindications. We'll talk about the contraindications later. So immunocompromised persons should be counseled about unknown vaccine safety profile and effectiveness in immunocompromised populations. Uh, persons with autoimmune conditions may receive the vaccine. Persons with a history of GBS, with a history of Bell's palsy, and also, according to WHO, the CDC was not very particular on, on the HIV population, but WHO outright said that uh, HIV patients uh, who are well controlled on uh, part and uh, part of a group recommended for vaccination may receive the vaccine. For vaccination of pregnant and lactating women, so for pregnant people, uh, as we've mentioned earlier, um, there's no data uh, on uh, safety and efficacy uh, in pregnant women or for lactating women. Uh, therefore, there is a need to weigh uh, the benefits versus the risks. And these are the things to consider when uh, we, you know, we, and we need to go over these with our patients uh, to help them uh, make their decision with regards to vaccination. So level of COVID-19 community transmission, patient's personal risk of contracting COVID-19. So for example, if the pregnant woman is a healthcare worker and exposed to COVID-19 patients, then that patient is, a high, is at a higher risk of uh, contracting COVID-19. The risks of COVID-19 to the patient and potential risks to the fetus, um, efficacy of the vaccine, side effects of the vaccine, and of course, we really need to stress that there's lack of data about the vaccine uh, during pregnancy. Uh, lactating people may choose to be vaccinated, but again, we need to um, inform them that there's uh, not enough data uh, on uh, the effects of vaccine uh, on uh, lactating uh, people. So contraindications, severe allergic reaction, or anaphylaxis after a previous dose of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine or any of its components, that's an absolute contraindication. Immediate allergic reaction of any severity to a previous dose of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine or any of its components, including polyethylene glycol. Immediate allergic reaction of any severity to polysorbit due to uh, potential cross-reactive hypersensitivity with a vaccine ingredient, polyethylene glycol. So for the precautions, history of any immediate allergic reaction to any other vaccine or injectable therapy, uh, you can consider that as a precaution. Uh, and these are the things that we need to consider, risk of exposure, risk of severe disease or death due to COVID-19, history of previous COVID-19 and how long ago somebody asked about the post-infection uh, immune uh, immunity phase, uh, which I answered in the chat box earlier. Uh, the unknown risk of anaphylaxis in a person with a history of an immediate allergic reaction to other vaccines or injectable therapies and ability of the patient to be vaccinated in a setting where appropriate medical care is immediately available for anaphylaxis. So I'm sure the... Uh, vaccine uh, expert panel uh, of the country will also be um, discussing this particular item uh, to determine uh, the, the best uh, setting for these types of patients to be vaccinated uh, in. 
So this is very important to remember because these are neither contraindications nor precautions, which means these patients can be vaccinated. So allergic reactions, including severe allergic reactions not related to vaccines, injectable therapies, or components of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines or polysorbates, such as allergy to food, pet, venom, or environmental allergies, or allergies to oral medications, including the oral equivalents of injectable medications, may receive the vaccine. Okay, so this is our last vaccine, the Astra vaccine. Uh, this is a, an interim analysis of four RCTs in Brazil, South Africa, and the UK. And when you really go through this article, you will see that this is the most uh, challenging uh, article to go through because there are so many permutations uh, in the different aspects of the study. So this is a non-replicating non chimpanzee adenovirus vector vaccine, two doses. And you, if you can see here, six to 12 weeks, which means it depends on the, the design of the trial. They had different dose intervals uh, in, for the two doses. And again, it's intramuscular. So uh, COV002 was done in the UK and COV003 uh, was done in Brazil. And these were the total participants, 7, 5, and 4,000. The comparison group was the meningococcal uh, vaccine. So um, for the design, um, the follow-up was 364 days, but uh, I'll mention later how long the actual follow-up was for this particular interim analysis. Primary study objective for COV002 done in the UK was to assess the efficacy of the vaccine against COVID-19 in adults aged um, 18 and over, uh, co-primary uh, to assess the safety in adults and children. Uh, for COV003, the primary study objective was uh, to evaluate the efficacy uh, against COVID-19 virologically confirmed um, disease. So for the study population, the UK study included healthy adults aged 18 and over. And they, but uh, for this study, they also had safety and immunogenicity sub-studies for healthy children aged 5 to 12 years and also HIV adult, uh, positive adults aged 18 to 55. Uh, for COV003, uh, the study population was uh, healthy professionals and adults with high potential for exposure to SARS-CoV-2 aged 18 and over. For the actual uh, treatment, and you can see here that they actually differ because uh, for the COV002, this is when they gave uh, low dose and standard dose to their subjects, to some subjects. Uh, I think uh, around uh, 1,300 subjects got the low dose, standard dose combination. Uh, the rest um, got the standard dose, standard dose combination. And for COV003, uh, um, they just gave the... Uh, standard dose. So, and you can see here the other secondary endpoints. I'll, I'll show you the results for that later. Okay. Uh, what's interesting here is that uh, for, a for a portion of the participants for COV002 that was done in the UK, they gave prophylactic treatment of paracetamol prior to uh, vaccination, while for, uh, only for a portion of participants, while for COV003 done in Brazil, they gave paracetamol systematically as uh, prophylactic treatment. So we also need to keep that in mind when we look at the adverse effects uh, of the vaccine. So in, the, in, this, uh, in these uh, trials, 35.6% uh, of the subjects had at least one comorbidity, so either cardiovascular, respiratory, or diabetes. Uh, this one is also interesting. Uh, it, it, with this uh, slide, we can see the timing of vaccine administration and those included in the primary analysis. And we can see here on the first column that the time between first and second dose of the low dose and uh, standard dose actually differed. 
So some were given uh, between six to eight weeks uh, interval, some between nine to 11 weeks, and some were given uh, 12 weeks and over. And the median time was about 84 days for, for this group. Um, for the standard dose, standard dose uh, regimen, they also had different intervals. So if you can imagine how difficult it is to uh, analyze all these subgroups. Um, so the, the, median, uh, the median days for COV002 was 69 days, but for the Brazil study, the median was 36 days. So, because as we know, when we talk about immunogenicity, um, the, the intervals uh, matter. So for the reporting of adverse events, all local and systemic AEs that occur within 18, 28 days after each uh, vaccination will be recorded. SAEs and adverse events of special interest will be collected throughout the study period up to 364 days after the last vaccination. So for the uh, ASTRA study, their follow-up time was actually one year uh, per protocol. Uh, adverse events of spe special interest include convulsion, other neurologic events, vascular events, thrombocytopenia, vasculitides, anaphylaxis, vaccine-associated enhanced respiratory disease, and potential immune-mediated conditions. So if you can see here, this is a, the trial that had the shortest uh, follow-up time. The mean duration was 105 post-dose uh, 1 and 62 days post-dose 2. So of the three trials, this one had the shortest uh, follow-up time. Uh, for the reporting of adverse events, um, for COV002 done in the UK, it's quite interesting that they even had to subgroup their subjects and set a maximum number uh, from whom to collect the solicited and unsolicited AEs from. That was quite interesting when you go over the paper. And for, again, for COV003, uh, for, the, for the interim analysis, uh, they uh, reported uh, for a subset of 200 participants. So for the solicited adverse events, local, similar to the other two trials earlier, pain and tenderness were the more, more um, common ones. Uh, for the systemic, uh, these occurred more commonly in the 18 to 55 and after the first dose. So headache, fatigue, malaise, muscle pain, um, feverish, chills, and joint pain. For serious adverse events occurring in more than uh, three uh, participants, and however, all of these events, serious adverse events were already adjudicated to be unlikely related to the vaccine. These included an angina pectoris, appendicitis, pyelonephritis, and intervertebral disc protrusion. However, there were three um, events, serious adverse events that were possibly related. One uh, case of hemolytic anemia in the control group that occurred 10 days after vaccination. One transfers uh, myelitis uh, in the vaccine group that occurred 14 days after the vaccination. And uh, one patient who had a fever of over 40 degrees Celsius uh, that, that the patient had for two days uh, in the vaccine group, but uh, that patient also uh, rapidly recovered. Uh, more of these serious adverse events unlikely related. So dysesthesia, hypoesthesia, paresthesia, sensory loss, visual impairment, and facial paralysis. And again, there's two more cases of transverse myelitis, one occurring in the vaccine group and the other in the control group, um, unlikely related. They were both adjudicated to be unlikely related to the vaccine. So for efficacy, we look at uh, so for efficacy, the follow-up was four months, and the number of subjects was uh, 11,636 for this interim analysis. For the standard dose, standard dose um, groups, um, the vaccine efficacy was 60.3% and 64.2%. And uh, this is interesting because in the UK group, 
the the interval was more than 12 weeks between the first and the second dose. But for the Brazil group, the interval between the first and second groups uh, was uh, around six weeks. So the, the paper was saying that in terms of vaccine efficacy, there's really not much difference uh, in terms of uh, intervals uh, in between doses. Um, so COVID-19 infection rate after 21 days of dose two, vaccine effect efficacy of 70.4%. For severe COVID, uh, vaccine efficacy is 100%. Uh, hospitalization rate, vaccine efficacy is 100%. So remember, in the initial, uh, when they were determining their primary and secondary endpoints earlier, one of the uh, things that they wanted to also look at was uh, mortality, but uh, they were not able to really, uh, perhaps the, the numbers they got weren't very robust enough to um, um, already report it in the interim analysis. So for the limitations of this trial, uh, it's unable to assess duration of protection. Less than 4% of participants were older than 70 years. Uh, no participants older than 55 years received the mixed dose regimen. Uh, those with comorbidities were a minority, uh, actually 35%, I think. Uh, in the interim analysis, only 12.1% of those assessed were older than 55%. Uh, so we cannot really infer efficacy in older adults using the numbers of this interim analysis. Uh, there's no immunogenicity data that exists for the mixed dose regimen. So for the clinical particulars, uh, and this is the UK um, um, equivalent of the FDA. For in, uh, it's, uh, the recommendation is for the Astra vaccine to be used in individuals 18 and over. There's limited efficacy and safety data in individuals uh, 65 and over. Contraindication is hypersensitivity to the active substances or to any of the excipients. Precautions, so concurrent illness, postpone in individuals suffering from an acute severe feb febrile illness, uh, thrombocytopenia or coagulation disorders. There's an unknown response in immunocompromised individuals. Limited experience in pregnant women. So again, the recommendation is consider the benefits versus the risks. And also it is unknown whether it is excreted in human milk. So this is my last slide. What are the reminders? Be mindful of the intricacies of the trials and papers. Um, things are not as straightforward as they seem. Even when you look at the papers, even if there is already... A uh, the formula in, in computing for vaccine um, efficacy, um, they use the, the, all these three papers use different methodologies in computing uh, for the vaccine efficacies. So they, they used uh, different models, different, different methods uh, to come up with their own uh, vaccine efficacy. Uh, we need to keep up with the evidence because this, these are just interim analyses. So we more uh, updated uh, information later on. Uh, we should get information from reputable sources. Uh, strive to look for data and I avoid extrapolating um, the data. Uh, wait for data because it shall come. Because if these vaccines of course, these, all of these vaccines would want commercial approval, right, for their products. So they will come up with the data to wait. And of course, decision making is key. And we need to remember that a vaccine with 100% efficacy will have zero if no one will get vaccinated. So I hope that um, we learn some things tonight, uh, things that we'll be able to uh, for ourselves and for our families and also our patients. Good evening and thank you for your time.
Thank you very much, Doctors uh, Villanueva and Roa, for the excellent high yield talks. Uh, by the way, um, doctors and uh, our attendees for tonight, may we just remind you for those who would like to request for the certificate of attendance, please send in your request to pcpcpd2018 at gmail.com. Now, in the spirit of, uh, of time, let us move on to a very quick Q&A. Um, there's been a number of questions in the chat box that, ha that has already been answered by our speakers and panelists. So thank you very much for that. Now, let us look at into maybe a couple more queries. Uh, but before I go into that, let me um, let me acknowledge the presence as well of our other panelists, Dr. Jelsa May Zabat, Dr. Minette Claire Ocampo, Dr. Zuzane Santos, and of course, Dr. Marisa Alejandria. All of them are fellows of the uh, Philippine Society of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. Thank you for um, answering the queries that are popping up in our Q&A. So um, maybe let me start off with um, one question that hasn't been answered yet. Um, this came up early on in the discussion. What is the reality that even accidents are being counted as COVID-19 cases? Um, maybe the question is how how accurate do you think the reporting is? So maybe any of our speakers or panelists can answer. Hello, Doctora. Okay, I'll give a shot at that. Uh, not sure what, how, or what is the. No idea behind the question. So I think it's asking about why it's being reported as COVID or uh, these deaths are being counted as due to COVID. Okay. Well, as you said, uh, this uh, deaths no, that occur after vaccination will really have to be investigated no, by the uh, uh, study team the FDA in terms of causality, okay? So it's not automatically counted as due to COVID. There has to be a significant uh, investigation or uh, review of the circumstances surrounding the death before they can uh, say whether it's really directly due to the vaccination or it's just coincidental to the vaccination. Okay. So there's a tendency to uh, sensationalize it as due to the vaccine just because it happened, but then it, they have to look at the temporality and the causality. Okay. May I add? Okay. So with regards to that, anyone who receives a vaccine is actually encouraged to report any health condition that occurs after vaccination. And this is because we want to study the vaccine properly and we want to also see all the possible effects or the safety events that can happen. So that's why it, uh, even accidents can be reported in relation to receiving vaccines. Yeah. Uh, in clinical trials, we call that the suspected unexpected adverse reactions. And as part of uh, GCP in clinical trials, any death will have to be reported. And then whether that's related or not, then that's where the adjudication comes in. Okay, thank you, doctors. For our next question, can you take oral antihistamine and steroids prior to vaccination and continue taking it for a week post-vaccination to prevent allergic reactions? One Power speakers or panelists? So, yeah. It's not advice to uh, take it before vaccination because it can blunt the immune response no? if you take these anti-inflammatories. So, but uh, it's indicated if you develop reactions after the vaccination, but it's not recommended to give it as a prophylaxis. Thank you, Dr. Um, another question, given all the data so far, will the PSMID endorse or recommend to the DOH any vaccine so far? Uh, 
Victoria Marisa. Or anyone. <laughs> or uh, any, uh, any of our uh, other uh, speakers. Yes, <laughs> answer. Or Sia. Uh, I think the important point would be if all the vaccines show good efficacy in safety data, any of the vaccines are acceptable. Especially now that we have, considering the limit of the supply, we need as much supply or stocks of any of the vaccines that show good efficacy and safety. Then just to add, the process of uh, giving a recommendation starts with the appraisal of the evidence. So we need to appraise the efficacy and safety. And then uh, we actually have to present no, the evidence summaries. We presented it now already to HTAC, the Health Technology Assessment Council, and then they will uh, be the one to look at the uh, other aspects of such as cost-benefit analysis no, on, with regards to procurement. But uh, for the clinical recommendation, the way we do it is really appraise the evidence uh, summaries and then present it to the consensus panel for vetting. So it's not a unilateral decision. And so we take into consideration the efficacy, safety, access issues, no, sorry, how to administer it. So, and then which groups should be vaccinated and which should not. Okay. Uh, next question. If individuals have a history of allergies to eggs, is it safe to give the COVID uh, vaccine? Yes, so it's, it's safe. So if you have allergies to eggs, to environmental allergens, to venom, uh, it's safe. Okay, thank yeah. you. Much, Dr. Extra uh, precautions will just have to be taken, but it's not contraindicated. All right. Thank you, Dr. Next question. Shall the candidates for vaccination be tested first, like PCR or antigen, to know if there's a current infection or antibody test to know if the candidate has been exposed already so prior to the vaccine? Uh, the recommendation is not to test, uh, if only to... Uh, use the information for decision-making with regards to vaccination. All right. Thank you, Dr. Uh, by the way, uh, for our audience, uh, you can still type in the Q&A box so that our panelists and speakers can see and answer you directly. Um, so we have a next question. Can a person be vaccinated even if he is diagnosed as hepatitis B positive? Is it a contraindication, uh, doctor? It's, it's not a contraindication. So actually in one of the, I think it was in the Pfizer study where um, they included uh, patients with stable uh, disease and this included patients with uh, hepatitis B. All right. Thank you, doctors. Uh, next question. Any comments regarding the Sinovac vaccine? Comments. What has been published is just the phase two. And... Uh, we're awaiting the uh, publication of the phase three trials. Okay. So again, it will have to undergo the same evidence review and they have to submit their documents to FDA if they would like to have an EUL, emergency U or EUA. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, next question, is there a recommendation to stop maintenance steroid therapy or immunosuppressive drugs before vaccination? Uh, I think this is in relation to questions about immunocompromised uh, patients. The trials did not include as many, so you have a small population. So you cannot have or give a clear-cut recommendation, but it should be a shared decision-making, meaning what is the risk of the patient? The physician has to discuss what is the risk of the patient of uh, exposure or even acquiring COVID-19 virus or infection, and then also discuss the possibility that because of this, uh, the receipt of the immunosuppressive agent, 
the efficacy of the vaccine may not be as robust as we expect it to be. And then the safety is also um, uh, unknown at this time. Now, if the patient and the doctor, because of the shared decision-making, say that, okay, most likely you will benefit from this vaccine and then allow the patient to receive the vaccine. Or even, I think we should allow the patients to ask as much questions about the vaccine that they want to receive. All right. Thank you, Doctoria. Next question: Would any of these have? Uh, would any of these vaccines have any interaction with this with seizure medications? Um, there was no uh, mention in any of the um, three trials that um, I discussed. There was no mention of any interaction with uh, anti-seizure medications. Okay. So, um, okay, since you have reviewed and studied the vaccines, if you will be given the choice, what will each of you choose personally or yourself and your fam for yourself and your family? Interesting question. Would anyone care to comment on that? If I may answer that. Go um, ahead. Uh, whatever vaccine with published phase three, as described by Dr. Kat a while ago, if it becomes available tonight, tomorrow, I will get it. Thank you for the answer, Dr. Any other, um, any other comments? Dr. Marisa, go ahead. Uh, I will get the one with the EUA and FDA approval. All right. Thank you, Doctora. Next question. Um, do persons with allergies to NSAIDs, um, can they be vaccinated? Yes. So that was in my slide. So even if you have an allergic reaction to any oral drugs, uh, you can be um, vaccinated. Again, um, just what Dr. Alendia mentioned earlier, maybe just take uh, more precautions um, when you get the vaccine. Maybe a follow-up question, Doctor. How about uh, chemotherapy? Is it a contraindication to any of the vaccines you mentioned? Um, so, so these people who are receiving chemotherapy fall under uh, immunocompromised individuals. Um, the the recommendation is uh, so. So there is no uh, there's not enough. Uh, data on these immunocompromised persons, um, there could be blunted immune response, right, in terms of uh, producing antibodies uh, to the vaccine. Uh, so this, have to, this has to be um, discussed with the patient. But uh, uh, outright contraindication, no. Yeah. Again, it will be a risk-benefit assessment and if we follow our general guidelines for in patients with immunocompromising conditions, if you can schedule it uh, before chemotherapy, so at least two weeks or a month before chemotherapy, then that would be uh, better you know, than giving it while uh, simultaneous with the chemotherapy. All right. Uh, if I may add to that, actually the, the CDC does have a specific recommendation, but it just says... Um, immuno immunocompromising conditions should be stable. Yeah. Yes. How that is defined will have to be discussed with the with the physician. Yeah, because uh, the reason for that is again, uh, if you are uh, actively on chemo or on immunosuppressive drugs, then your immune response is blunted, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Roa, and that has to be explained to the patients. No. Thank you, doctors. Maybe in the spirit of time, this will be our last question, but don't worry. I can see 40 plus questions still here in the Q&A box, but definitely our speakers and panelists will find a way to uh, get to answer your question. So for the last question, which are uh, Philippine FDA approved for emergency use um, already? So they're talking about the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, if I may answer that, uh, this was um, announced last, I believe, January 14 by the Director General of the Philippine FDA, Dr. Eric Domingo. Um, the F Pfizer's vaccine was given an EUA, and I believe there are two others 
that have submitted requirements, applications for EUA, Astra, and Gamalea. So we are awaiting the, the, the result of the application. And then uh, the most recent submission was that of Sinovac last January 13. And those are the vaccines that we are awaiting the results of the EEUA application. Thank you, Dr. Ra. So again, in the interest of time, we are already um, 20, uh, 17 minutes over time. Uh, but definitely, um, again, our panelists and speakers will answer your questions. We'll send them all your queries and definitely we'll get back to you with their answers. And so with that, thank you again to our speakers and panelists for sharing your expertise with us tonight. I'm sure that our audience will leave this webinar more informed regarding the current evidences surrounding the COVID vaccines. Uh, by the way, see you again next week. We will have another webinar on January 25. This will be entitled Principles and Equitable Rollout of a COVID-19 Vaccination Program in the Philippines. So watch out for the official invite and link in our Facebook page. But for now, good night, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you. Many thanks to all. Thank you very much.